Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever we are in the world. Um, welcome to the Asia Pacific Intensive Care Symposium 2020. This is track six, the evolution of rapid response in the face of COVID-19. I'm uh, Augustine T, your moderator for this session from the chapter of Rapid Response Systems, Society of Intensive Care Medicine, Singapore. Uh, COVID-19 has affected all of us and uh, the response of COVID-19 has occurred in hospitals as well as outside hospitals where rapid response systems continue to save lives as they have before the pandemic. With this in mind, we have an exciting lineup of speakers today um, to tell you more about uh, rapid response systems in the hospitals and even outside hospitals. Uh, a bit of housekeeping rules. We have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type them in and we will get around to the questions and answers uh, as we go along in this track. Without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker. She's uh, Associate Professor Roshni Gokhale from Changi General Hospital, Singapore. Um, Associate Professor Roshni is uh, trained from India and has double accreditation in acute medicine and intensive care uh, in the UK in 2014. Um, he, she trained in intensive care at, in Cambridge, UK and obtained the EDIC and Fellowship of the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, UK. Currently, she is the Director of Medical Intensive Care at Changi General Hospital, Singapore and Deputy Director of the Medical Emergency Team Committee. She has a keen interest in education, especially the use of simulation training to train junior doctors on how to recognize and attend to a deteriorating patient. Uh, Professor Roshni's uh, title of the talk is The Use of PAPR in Resuscitation and Rescue Scenarios for COVID-19. Over to you, Roshni. Thank you. I'm just going to screen share. Okay. Okay, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the sponsors and organizers of the Asia Pacific Intensive Care Symposium for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. T. Um, my talk today, as uh, was said by uh, Dr. T, was that uh, we are, I'm just trying to share our experience at Changi General Hospital in the use of the PAPR uh, whilst attending to cardiac arrest and other emergency scenarios. Um, the picture that you see uh, on the right is of our PAPR team, which is made up of various uh, uh, representatives from various departments, infection control, critical care nursing, emergency planning and the simulation center, uh, in addition to the respiratory and critical care medicine department. And without whose support, I don't think we would be able to have such a successful PAPR program at our hospital. I have no disclosures um, uh, in particular with regards to this talk. Um, and the brief outline of my talk will include uh, PAPR or the Powered Air Purifying Respirator, the science and the evidence behind it. I'd like to speak a little bit about the protocol that we have developed at Changi Hospital and uh, I'd like to share some useful lessons that we have learned from the experience of running simulation uh, and uh, uh, this protocol. All right, so I start off with uh, PPE. So the current COVID-19 pandemic has actually exposed what a huge demand there is for PPE to help deliver care to patients. And this demand uh, occurs right from frontline medical personnel all the way to laboratory staff, handling specimens to the maintenance and housekeeping departments of uh, the healthcare institutions. And the way we decide what PPE that we are going to use uh, when dealing with different infectious outbreaks is mainly uh, dependent on the following two key considerations. Uh, the mode of transmission uh, of that particular respiratory or other contagion and high exposure practices that might put medical personnel uh, especially at a risk of high exposure and a high risk of con uh, contracting the illness from the patients themselves. So examples of uh, such high exposure practices would be uh, the aerosol generating procedures in particular uh, with respect to respiratory illnesses like COVID-19. 
So coming to the powered air purifying respirator, basically it's a device that um, helps to filter out the contaminants in the air uh, and uses a battery operated blower, which then uh, passes this clean air to the user. And this clean air can be passed over either via a tight fitting respirator or a loose fitting hood or a helmet. So the filters that are used by the PAPR devices actually are high, provide a high level of protection and they filter out 99.97% of all particles which have a diameter of 0.3 microns uh, and larger and are oil proof. So you can see that the, uh, the protection that is provided by the PAPR device is you know, uh, quite high. Um, however, I would like to also point out at this point that the CDC actually currently recommends the use of the N95 as the minimum PPE whilst performing these AGPs, but does put in a line that we should recommend or consider using the PAPR. Uh, Australian guidelines, on the other hand, definitely recommend the PAPR if especially the medical health personnel is going to be in an enclosed space in, uh, with the patient who has a, a contagious illness and if the exposure time is going to be over an hour. So to give you some idea about the difference in protection, uh, uh, the assigned protection factor uh, that the PAPR has is about two and a half to 100 times greater than that of the N95. And this is the uh, uh, factor that uh, is assigned by the Occupational Sa uh, and Safety and Health Administration uh, sort of organization. Um, and uh, hence, you can see the difference between the N95 and the PAPR. Uh, so just taking you through briefly uh, through the different generations of respirators that we've had and the APF that they offer, you can see the half masks and the full face piece uh, masks. And as the technology advances, you can see how the APF increases as well. Um, this, uh, this, these pictures uh, show the, the uh, devices that are now available uh, in the market. And in our own hospital, we use uh, the, the picture to the extreme left is uh, the kind of a PAPR that we use in our hospital. And you can see that you have a full piece uh, face mask and a loose fitting hood and the battery uh, is connected to the, pay, uh, to the user via a belt. Uh, so this is how the PAPR works. Um, and as, as the uh, technology advances, you can see the APF factors are slowly increasing from 25 right up to 10,000. Um, so whilst I have like, you know, uh, told you about the, the protection that the PAPR offers, I think it's only fair that I also inform you about the few cons that the PAPR uh, uh, brings with it. So there are definitely challenges in verbal communication. It limits visual field and decreases audibility. Uh, it definitely requires a proper maintenance program. So disinfection, especially after every use, cleaning, safe storage, and battery maintenance. So all of this uh, is uh, an additional uh, amount of maintenance that is required for the PAPR. Uh, the filters are not disposable between patients, uh, and we usually dispose the filters after their, uh, you know, their life is over. Uh, there's always a risk of battery failure and inadvertent exposure of the medical personnel. Uh, it's definitely more expensive than the N95, but it achieves more wares per piece, and so the cost evens out. And uh, if you are using the PAPR uh, in your hospital, then it, there is a requirement to educate the personnel that is using this PAPR. So they need to be induced into how you, it works. They have to practice donning and doffing. And um, yeah, uh, and it's not as simple as just putting on the mask and uh, disposing it after you use. So some of the disadvantages that you might consider. Um, at Changi Hospital, actually, uh, in our program, we uh, advocate the combination of the N95 and the PAPR, and it is this, and uh, and we um, we do this because uh, we feel that there have been several N95 face. Uh, seal leaks, even though, uh, you know, the pay, uh, people have been uh, fit tested, they are not always over, uh, they are not all completely overcome by this fit testing. So there are face leaks that occur. Um, when you don either the PPE or the, sorry, either the N95 or the PAPR, um, and you're donning it uh, in a hurry, whilst uh, trying to attend to emergent procedures or emergency situations, uh, uh, then there is always a risk of incorrect donning. Uh, so in combination, we feel that the protection offered is better. Uh, the PAPR does offer splash exposure uh, to face and neck areas as well as some eye protection. Uh, the 
people wearing the PAPR have definitely fed back to say that their sort of work of breathing is better because of the positive airflow from the PAPR. And there's definitely a, a more comfort with regards to the heat and humidity that is felt by them, especially if they are in a prolonged uh, resuscitation effort. And if you're using the PAPR alone, there's always the risk of the PAPR device failing, either because you haven't worn it correctly, you haven't tested it before use, or the batteries have failed. And hence, for the following reasons, we always advocate that, especially when medical personnel are um, going to do aerosol generating procedures, we definitely advocate the combination of the N95 and the PAPR. So this is a small study that actually uh, did uh, uh, a little bit of work on what protection factor is uh, uh, you can get using the PAPR and the N95 and the PAPR together at various uh, minute volumes. And you can see that uh, the combination actually always offered a better protection than the PAPR alone. So just a little bit of evidence to back our uh, policy of advocating the combination. Okay, these are common aerosol generating procedures for which we will advocate the use of the PPE and P PAPR and it's common knowledge to most. I'd just like to point out that even procedures like open suctioning and uh, NG tube insertions would also be considered as aerosol generating procedures in, in addition to the usual nebulizing, uh, nebulization, bronchoscopy, bag valve ventilation, intubation and non-invasive in uh, ventilation. All right. Moving on, um, I'd like to say something about our PAPR journey at Changi General Hospital. Uh, we've been conducting workshops with the use of PAPR right from 2017. Um, and these workshops were carried out at uh, various local and regional intensive care uh, um, uh, conferences. And we used to help people to plan their uh, resuscitation protocols, uh, keeping their own hospital uh, manpower resources and other specifics in mind. And then they used to take them through simulation to help to actually enact their uh, responses and then uh, understand the need for the further planning and resource development, equipment, uh, uh, acquiring equipment, et cetera. So when uh, COVID actually finally hit us in February 2020, we modified this resuscitation protocol to uh, fit nicely to respond to COVID-19. Uh, this involved a lot of planning and training, as you might imagine. And through this training, we were actually able to, uh, you know, obtain a large resource to help us to revise and update our uh, initial protocol. So the planning that was uh, required was extensive, uh, but I'm just highlighting a few uh, important areas that we considered. So space planning is very important and you need to consider the space in each room, in the ward areas that patients are housed, corridors and how you best utilize the space. And I think the nursing were a very important like source of information and help when we were doing this planning. We had to plan the safe donning and doffing practices. And in the infection control department is a very good resource for helping you out on this count. Manpower availability, especially you need to consider what is your manpower availability out of hours and the minimum numbers you're going to require to run this response. Uh, also equipment availability. How much of PAPR do you actually have uh, how much of N N95 masks uh, do you actually have and how are you going to allocate these resources to the various ward locations where these patients are housed. So the emergency planning team in our hospital helped us uh, to, uh, to sort of sort out these details. Uh, in addition, the other things that we did was we came up with disposable intubation kits and disposable drug kits that the pharmacy and respiratory therapists helped to make up, which we could just use in the rooms that we went into and then dispose after the, a single use. Uh, our emergency carts were all wiped down and contained all, contained all essential consumables that were required to attend to a cardiac res, uh, uh, arrest situation. Disinfection protocols, regular testing and maintenance of the PAPR was then taught to all the nursing and the staff that were present even on the wards. Uh, and, it, uh, yeah, and all this information had to be disseminated and regularly practiced. Um, Posters like this were examples of the planning that we uh, did. Uh, so we had posters which helped to remind the users of how to don PAPR, the various steps, as well as how to doff PAPR. And these were kept, uh, 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 these were put up at regular intervals uh, in the wards where there was a likelihood that PAPR would be used uh, and served very important visual clues. 
So talking about uh, the actual resuscitation protocol, there were a few salient principles behind this uh, res resuscitation protocol, and these were as follows. We wanted to make sure that the response time to emergencies was kept as short as possible uh, and similar to uh, non-infectious patients, just to ensure that good outcomes were, uh, you know, we, we had good outcomes across the board, and these patients were not like disadvantaged to, uh, because of the infectious illness. We also simultaneously wanted to ensure Sure that our frontline staff were always adequately protected. Uh, this helped with their morale boosting as well. Strict infection control standards had to be adhered to, and we did teach and train specifically with regards to communication, role assignment, and leadership during this kind of resuscitation. So our response was divided into two teams. We had the first responders and the second responders. The first responders were basically the, uh, the staff on the ward who would be uh, uh, responding to the emergency uh, on a regular basis and uh, would be usually the first responders. So we had two nurses and a junior doctor. They would be required to put on basic PPE, which include the surgical cap, the eye protection, N95 mask, gloves, and gown, um, and go in to assess the situation. Once a cardiac arrest was established, then a call was put out to the medical emergency team. But team one was supposed to continue the resuscitation effort and carry out cardiac compressions, defibrillation, and emergency drug administration. Um, oxygen was delivered to the patient, but this was via a non-rebreathe mask, and it was to deliver passive oxygenation and ventilation to the patient. In the meanwhile, team two would uh, start donning the PPE as well as the PAPR. And the team too usually consisted of the medical emergency team, which was one senior resident, a ICU uh, nurse, and a respiratory therapist. They would then enter, have a brief handover from team one. Team one would leave the room and allow team two to carry out the AGP, which was the securing the airway. And one or two members of team one would then redon the PPE and PAPR and join team two. Um, we did this because we felt as if five was the minimum number of, pay of people that would be required to carry out this PAPR response. So this was the basic uh, kind of uh, protocol that we developed. Uh, and the training was carried out through in-situ simulation sessions. The training was always uh, given to um, the groups that were mixed to allow for bonding and teamwork. Uh, we went through PAPR familiarization. People were asked to practice the donning and the doffing. The risks of the AGPs were explained. And finally, they were allowed to do the simulation, uh, uh, do the cardiac arrest scenarios through the simulation and to practice their response, practice their communication uh, and teamwork. All right, I'll now move on to a few lessons that we learned uh, from uh, the tra simulation training that we had carried out. So during donning, we realized often there were people who forgot their basic PPE, so this needed to be reminded. Even if the PPE was put on, sometimes it was not secured well. So we had open gowns and gloves torn, et cetera, during the resuscitation effort. Uh, people tend to break their PPE, for example, to reach out for a pen or a phone. Um, and so we had to remind them about the transmission through fomites. Doffing, again, was one area where we realized that when people were in a cardiac uh, arrest scenarios with the PPE, when they came out, they were in a hurry to, uh, to take off their, uh, their PPE. And hence, there was a lot of splash exposure to the environment, so they had to be reminded not to doff uh, you know, in a hurry. Um, and also about the hand hygiene after every doffing step. Uh, a runner, the runner was a really important role that we found that if one uh, person was uh, dedicated to guide the donning and doffing of the team, then this really improved the practice. Other lessons in infection control, we found that face shields were better than goggles, especially for uh, people wearing glasses. And uh, one important point was about the breaking of the negative pressure uh, in the room. We decided that uh, once the patient was intubated, only then we would open the door to allow for non-essential activities like going for uh, getting bloods done or taking an ABG, et cetera. But till, that was, till the closed breathing circuit was established, we tried to keep the door closed as much as possible. Finally, in terms of clinical management, um, we found that, oops, all right. We found that there was definitely some compressor fatigue. Um, 
because of the prolonged period of time that one or two members may be uh, on their own with the patient. Um, the AED was extremely useful, but could be interruptive. Um, for scribing and timing, we definitely recommend a whiteboard with a timer and digital clocks in the room. Um, and there needs to be some sort of manpower planning in terms of skill set distribution between the two teams so that all the essential activities can be uh, done by both the teams. So these were some of the lessons that we learned from the training that we carried out. And uh, to end, I will sort of leave you with a video of our simulation. Um, and you can see the team one member donning his PPE. The cardiac compressions have started with just one member in the team whilst the second member puts on her PPE. The second member usually brings the emergency cart in to prevent frequent opening and closing of the doors. And there you can see in the inset, the PAPR team are here, but they are still getting their, um, their kit on. Defibrillation can carry on with just the first team in, uh, even though the second team has not arrived yet. A brief handover between team one and team two. Now team two are on their own and their main job is to secure the airway. Yeah. So they finally have the ROSC and the ventilator comes in uh, to be attached and the patient can then be transported away. All right. I'll end with that and I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Right, thank you, uh, Roshni. Um, it's great to see that uh, the preparedness finally got, uh, you know, its usefulness during this pandemic. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll move on to our second speaker. Um, she's Dr. Tohan from Woodland Health Campus in Singapore. And Dr. Tohan is um, a consultant anesthesiologist at Woodlands Health Campus. Um, she has a special interest in uh, airway and trauma care. But in particular, during uh, the COVID-19 response in Singapore, when there was a migrant worker outbreak, uh, we have these um, community care facilities. And Dr. Tohan was deeply involved in the setup of these community care facilities where uh, the migrant worker COVID positive patients were actually housed. But I'll leave Dr. Tohan to tell us more about her experience uh, during COVID-19. So Dr. Tohan, please. Hi, thank you, Prof. And thank you, everyone, for joining me this afternoon to listen about our experience in Singapore. Um, I will just give me one second while I share screen. Okay, so um, just to give a really big, uh, a quick background, Woodlands Health Campus is actually a hospital that's still being built. And uh, we're currently uh, located in the north of Singapore and we will be opening at the end of 2022 or beginning of 2023. The opening has of course been delayed because of the COVID situation. So in the meantime, um, when COVID happened in Singapore and the migrant workers were the ones that were greatly affected, we were then tasked with the uh, we were then tasked with the need to open up um, big isolation facilities to house these migrant workers, keep them safe monitor them as well as to keep them isolated from the rest of the community until things are better and they are actually deemed non-infectious. So um, without much ado, I do not have any conflict of interest and I do hope to cover this during uh, briefly during my talk today. So this is how uh, Sunrise looked at Expo uh, where we spend most of our time there day in and day out. And um, this is how the hall looked like. In one of, this is one of the halls in Expo. We actually have 10 of these halls. 
So just a brief overview, we actually started on 9th of April uh, and then at peak admission somewhere in end of April, we actually had 500 uh, patients admitting to us a day and as a very rough estimate of about 20,000 patients have passed through our doors over the last six months when Expo was in uh, operations. At Emax, we had 10 halls open, and this was run not just by Sing Health, but uh, sorry, not just by Woodlands, but also by Sing Health and SAF, who came on board very quickly and rapidly to assist in, in the manning of these halls. Uh, so the rest of the management that we'll talk about is actually specific to Woodlands Health Campus, as Sing Health actually um, had their own set of protocols for their own halls. So for us, um, our manning ratio was actually quite low. And as you can see, the doctors and the nurses ratio compared to what we are used to in our acute restructured hospitals is very different. Hence, there was a very urgent need to develop a very fast and easy triage for both the doctors and the medical um, team, the nursing and the medical team to actually monitor our patients and as well to flag up any patients that require close attention. And uh, we then have to implement various ways and measurements, which I'll go into later. Um, the numbers for the doctors are tweaked in accordance to what happens in the hall because certain halls will be admitting, um, having admissions at certain times. So we would then have an admission team that actually just moved from hall to hall to clear these numbers while we had a core team of doctors to man um, the halls for the existing patients that are already there. A uh, very brief layout of how Expo looks like. There are 10 halls in total, six on one side and four on the other side. So we actually started with hall three and hall four where we had a single bunk bed. And uh, there was a capacity of 480 beds in these two halls. However, we, we quickly realized that this was definitely not enough to accommodate um, the explosion of cases among the foreign workers. And therefore, we then double bunk hall ones to five, six, and seven to 10 with um, two beds in each cubicle. And that gave us a capacity of about 8,000 beds. Um, at the back where the service bay is, is actually where the patients um, get off the buses, the, um, disembark, and then they enter the halls to be to be reviewed by our team. And the front of the hall is actually our um, dirty corridor where the staff enters and uh, enters the halls and exit the halls as well. Uh, so there are also common areas inside the halls where patients can actually sit and uh, interact with each other as well as with the medical and nursing team inside. So just to give you a quick idea of how fast we had to open halls, we started on 9th of April. Um, in Hall 3 Parkway, first started Hall 4. And then uh, just a week later, we had to open Hall 5. Barely four days later, we opened Hall 6. Um, two days later, SAF came on board to help us while we all opened Halls 1 and 2. So that was another three days. Um, hall 7 was then started by us in, on 1st of May and Sing Health then quickly came on board to help take over. And we took over Hall 4 and then the rest were then opened by Sing Health. So within the span of a month, we opened 10 halls to accommodate all the patients. Um, on 23rd, it was when we tweaked our admissions to, uh, to start centralized admissions instead of having five parallel processes where there were five different admission points. We just all centralized them into one hall. And also we started taking our phase 2A plus patients, which I will go into in a bit. Um, so... When the patient arrives to us, they actually come through um, a, a whole journey with us. First, they have an orientation by our managing agent, which was Resorts World Singapore. And without them, um, a lot of uh, things that Expo would have never been done so smoothly or carried out even. So they would actually undergo orientation to the facilities, the house rules, um, how the timings of various of meals, showers and all that are like. We then uh, have a quick review with them by both the nursing and medical team to do a quick triage to make sure that this patient is indeed having a mild form of COVID and he's then well enough to be in the isolation facility. If the patient do need any medications, usually acute um, upper respiratory tract medications such as paracetamol, lozenges, they will then be given at admission. And if any of the patients do have chronic medical conditions, and we do have quite a bit of them having diabetes or even hypertension, they are also then um, checked to make sure that they have sufficient amounts and um, will top up as necessary. In addition, we came up with a health booklet 
that are actually translated to nine different languages. And this was done by my really wonderful team of medical officers who source um, uh, all over to get them translated into Bengali, Hindu, the various um, dialects in, in India, as well as Bangladeshi, Thai, Myanmar and even Vietnamese and Chinese. And this health booklet gave some FAQ and some information to the migrant workers about what COVID is about, what they are doing here and what is to be expected. Uh, we will then um, do further investigations as required, such as chest x-ray, which I'll elaborate further. And the last thing is what we call vital signs monitoring of VSM teaching. So this VSM teaching is um, actually a self-administered flow where the patient goes to a centralized kiosk and then uh, enters his parameters such as blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature. So we do once a day monitoring for the majority of them and three, three times a day mon um, monitoring for phase 2A. Uh, apologies, I will go into the details about phase 1 and phase 2A in a short while. So this compliance is then tracked by the nurses and then we will flag up as necessary. We also have we also run a sick bay from two, one, uh, 9 a.m. to 12 noon as well as 2 to 5 p.m. where the patients come in and report sick like any other clinic. There is actually a medical team and nursing team there, stationed there to actually review these patients and also take a look. If there's any patients that require um, further review or escalation, there's actually always a senior around and we do go in usually about evening time to have a look at them and see whether or not they are still um, well and, and able to stay in expo or they do have to be sent out to the hospitals. We can do some basic um, point of care testing such as ECG, hypocount, um, and we also can monitor them for a short while in a sick bay. Of course, if there is a need to, there is, uh, there is already a workout flow where we can send our patients back to the acute hospital for further management. The patients are also um, um, going through a series of daily activities. They actually do have some exercises, games. My nurses and my medical team has also planned activities such as carom boards. Um, some of them were even given badminton rackets to play, um, as tolerated, of course. We will then also have um, regular updates on notice boards where um, we update them about what is expected, whether there are any changes in protocols, such as uh, discharge swaps or discharge pro um, um, procedures. Finally, when they're deemed non-infectious, we will then uh, discharge them as per MOH guidelines to clean sites, dorms, or the community. So um, just to go directly into what our admission criteria is going to be like, we initially started with phase one and phase two A patients and phase two A plus patients came on a bit later. So phase one patients were deemed as um, past the first seven days of critical illness and they're actually day eight or more. They could be of any age and they're considered well and able to in be independent and have self-care and they could then be warded in um, CCF for usually about a week or two at the most until they're deemed non-infectious. Phase 2A patients were the ones that we were targeting, um, were actually the patients in the first seven days of illness, which we all know that usually are when the manifestations appear. They are usually, we limited them to the younger group of 17, 35 year old, just basically because the older patients are generally deemed to be at higher risk of complications from COVID. Uh, as with, uh, they have to be well and they cannot be obese. They're, they're not supposed to be have any fever or any radiological or clinical evidence of pneumonia before they are allowed to be sent to CCF. So, however, we realized that there was really an increasing demand for beds. Um, we need to relieve the acute hospitals. And there was this subset group of patients of 35 to 45 year old who were actually monitored in hospitals and deemed to be very well. And actually, then the, the admission criteria to CCF then expanded um, roughly about three weeks into opening C Expo, where, where we decided that, okay, these patients have been deemed well and they have not been having much um, eventful diseases in the hospital and we should then decan them to the Expo. So we expanded the group to 45 years old, but however, we decided to label them as a phase 2A patients and we need to give them a little bit more monitoring. So with these... Um, and bear in mind, this was all the way in April where we didn't have very much data to go on. Um, we then decided that a very quick way of deciding whether they're well or not was to actually look at the new score or uh, the National Early Warning Score that originated from UK. 
So this was after much discussion back and forth with NCID, with MOH, uh, that we then decided to take this group of patients that are well, but older and have definitely a little bit more risk of things happening. So the, just a little bit of background, um, I don't profess to be an expert on new score, but I would just like to give you guys a taste of what it's like and how it has been used in UK and overseas as well. So it's initially developed by the Royal College of Physicians in the UK as a quick tool for inpatient uh, deterioration and how they should be responded to it. So um, prior to, to the development of news in UK, they realized that there was actually plenty of early warning scores out there, but none was consistent enough to use and therefore that led to a gap in patient care. So this was then rolled out to UK and uh, is now widely used across the board in UK. They then updated the version to news too, which included uh, oxygen saturation scores for patients who are known to be type two respiratory failure, such as your COPD patients. Uh, the recognition of uh, confusion as an important marker, as well as, uh, as well as, uh, sorry, um, yeah. So then uh, NHS in UK then also have advocated use of this in COVID-19 patients, but I'll go a little bit in depth in the next few slides. So for those who are not familiar, this is what the National Early Warning Score looks like. There are actually a few parameters they look at, respiratory rate, oxygen. So scale two for SpO2 is then targeted at um, patients who have hypercapnic respiratory failure, such as COPD. Um, and you can see that the threshold for the SpO2 is actually lower than the scale one, which is for um, the general population. Whether the patient needs oxygen supplementation or not, um, the systolic BP, the pulse, the conscious level, so whether they're alert, whether they're confused, the only response to voice, pain, or even unresponsive, and the temperature. So the further the, de the deviation of the parameters from the norm, the higher the score are. And then you total up the score for this few parameters. So what does the score tell you? The score then um, gives you an idea of how the response should be like. So a, a score of zero to four would actually just be a quick assessment by the ward nurse and whether the ward nurse then decides if there is a need to escalate care or they should just increase the frequency um, of monitoring of this patient. If the score is three, um, if there's a score of three in any um, parameter, then you, the nurse should then alert the ward-based doctor to review the patient and deem whether they should also escalate the frequency of monitoring or escalate the care. A uh, medium score of five to six should have an urgent review by the ward-based doctor and whether or not, and uh, decide whether or not they need to escalate this care to the ICU team. And a scale seven or more requires an urgent or emergency response from the critical care team as well for transfer to a higher uh, monitoring area such as high dependency or ICU. So um, I'm not gonna go into details about um, how new score were used in, in hospital. So we decided to use new score as kind of an early um, triage for patients to come to us. And um, this was based on a few things. And we realized that new score had actually been used in pre-hospital validation as well as emergency validation, which is kind of in line with what we are doing at Expo. Uh, and there have been some good feedback from UK in general, as well as some um, centers overseas. So um, it has been deemed as a pragmatic triage true in a in identifying and facilitating, facilitating early recognition of deteriorating patients. And the paramedics who have managed to score uh, new scores actually have, uh, found, have found that the higher new scores have of course been associated with higher incidence of adverse outcomes. And um, back in Japan as well, in a community hospital, they found that this also um, has helped flag out patients who require acute care admissions. Um, it also serves for the paramedics itself as a very clear means of communicating. So if they say that it's a new score of five, then everybody kind of understands how sick this patient is and where the appropriate disposition of this patient should be. And, and this became a kind of a universal language for the, uh, for the, it became kind of a universal language for the, uh, the organizations as well as different interdisciplinary as well. In the emergency department, they found that it was a good um, way to kind of track the patient's development during their stay. They measured the score at zero, 
one and five uh, in 24 hours to see whether there was a worsening of the score or improvement of the score. And that also serves as how um, they can decide whether to send a patient to general ward, um, high dependency or ICU and so forth. Um, it has also been found to add prognostic information to the pneumonia severity index as well as the CURB 65 score for patients with pneumonia and respiratory symptoms also Patients with respiratory symptoms also um, have a good correlation with the need for ICU stay. So um, while I said earlier that NHS has advocated the use of new score for stratification um, of COVID patients, then uh, paper, papers published later with, of course, um, hindsight and more data actually showed a lot of mixed results. Uh, do bear in mind that we actually implemented this in N April. And most of the studies that I'm uh, going to quickly discuss here actually came out much later. So UK was the first, of course, to look at new score. And this was done in five centers. And they realized that it's actually a weak predictor for the severity of COVID-19 at 14 days. However, Italy and Norway seem to have a good um, usage of this uh, COVID, sorry, of this new score for COVID patients. And even the Norway people even felt that it was actually superior to something like Q so far score uh, for clinical scoring of patients with uh, disease progression and uh, mortality as well. The UK, the UK team then went on to have an external validation with Wuhan um, and continue uh, publish a second paper in September where they use an external validation from Wuhan to show that actually it kind of gives a poor to moderate discrimination for midterm um, COVID outcome scores. So um, hence, as you can see, there's plenty of uh, results out there, plenty of conflicting answers and all that. But I think for our purpose, it kind of serves as a very um, quick and easy triage tool for the emergency department or the swap teams that were sent out to the um, dormitories to kind of have a good triage on how, whether or not this patient should go to Expo or they should need further um, intensive uh, higher care in the hospitals. So um, these were the modifications that the various um, papers and the various um, teams have actually come up with. Also to include a wider clinical assessment, to add in age, to actually improve risk stratification using um, blood parameters and also to take into consideration the increase in the oxygen demand rather than just the fact that the patient needs oxygen. And um, so, of course, there are also criticism, as I mentioned earlier, and in interest of time, I'm just going to move on. Um, but I think the main thing we need to take away from this is that as COVID-19 evolves and we find out more and more about it, we do realize that it's not just so simple as knowing whether the patient needs oxygen or not, but things like age, history, uh, sorry, age, gender, cardiovascular history, and all that do also um, play a big role in the disease progression of COVID-19 itself. So um, I'm just going to go through what we do at Expo. So this is a picture of our nurses and medical team triaging the patients. Um, so what we do is actually at triage, we then have a medical and nursing review. And one of the quick tests that we came up with is actually an effort tolerance test called a six minutes walk test. And this was developed by one of the um, cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Uh, Kung, who came on board with us. Um, so what we do is um, we do flag up patients who have borderline vital sign results, such as uh, temperature, um, borderline SpO2 results. If they do have complaints of dyspnea or chest pain, we assess them. And if we think that they're able to, we'll get them to walk for six minutes. We measure their SpO2 before and after and see whether there's actually a deterioration in SpO2, whether they get tachycardic, whether they can't even complete the minutes. And of course, these are all then very sensitive tests for the fact that this patient is not doing quite well. And we may, we would definitely have to either um, escalate care by doing an x-ray, monitoring at sick bay for a little bit further, or actually send back to hospital even. So um, this is just a pictorial diagram of what we do. Um, we don't necessarily need them to walk um, 30 meters, but some of, sometimes due to space constraints, you just get them to walk in circles for 60 minutes, for, for six minutes. And um, they, they, do, they do understand what's happening. And actually we even have patients who have been staying with us who step forward to actually communicate these instructions to the various patients as well. Um, we do have a great bunch of emergency physician. That's my uh, boss there, Prof Mohan, who actually brought in ultrasound as a quick um, an easy point of care testing for pneumonia. So 
there is actually an ED physician who is on every day to do what we call a POCUS round. So during the day, the team will then um, flag out any patients who are either seen at admission or at sick bay who may need um, further evaluation. Chest x-rays may or may not be available, um, or we may just need a little bit more detail. And then we'll flag them up for ultrasound um, to be monitored. Uh, sorry, for, for ultrasound to give us a clearer picture of what's happening. So um, the ED physicians follow the blue protocol for a lung ultrasound to look out for all these um, few indicators. And um, if my video plays well, this is just a very quick ultrasound of how one of our patients look like. So you could see the curly B lines and uh, they were a little bit abnormal. This patient then uh, went on to have a chest x-ray and found to have a consolidation and we sent him back to the acute hospital straight away. So we do have chest x-rays and we were supported very greatly by the NHG Diagnostics team as well as the SATA team. It was actually a mobile van that was stationed um, at the service bay behind the expo halls. They operate nine to five every day and uh, reporting is done by the same day for Mondays to Saturdays and then Sunday films are then reported by Monday lunchtime. Um, so initially we were doing chest x-rays for everybody who did not have a chest x-ray because we was just so worried about them. Um, but we realized that more and more these patients were admitted directly from the dormitories and there was no um, way that they could have had an x-ray before that. And we were then, um, our machines were then of course crying for help, they were almost going to break down. And we figured that actually most of the x-rays that we're doing were normal and we should then refine our criteria further. So this was the final criteria for a chest x-ray where they should have either a normal abnormal sign or abnormal clinical findings. Um, before they should go for a chest x-ray. Of course, at the end of the day, a clinical decision and clinical review uh, trumps it all. Um, other things we do in uh, Expo would be actually lab tests. We could send labs and we had an agreement with the Changi uh, Laboratory because they were the closest hospital to us that uh, we could do some common lab tests. But we do not want to be a chronic care facility. So we do not do things like fasting lipids, fasting glucose to monitor those patients who have hypertension or hyperlipidemia or diabetes. We also have ECG, um, hypocount and urine dipstick uh, capabilities at Expo, as I've mentioned. So um, the other big thing that we do in to monitor this group of patients and flag up anything fast is actually what we call vital signs monitoring or VSM. Um, so this is our medical polls and nursing polls. We actually have a recess room, a sick bay, and we actually have emergency activation bells along the corridors. So how it works is that we have monitoring kiosks um, along the common corridors in the halls. The patients each have a personalized account and they were then to enter their parameters into a mounted tablet next to the kiosk and the data will then flow to an uh, internet-based platform which is then monitored by the nurses. Um, VSM1 means once a day monitoring and VSM3 means three times a day monitoring. We place our phase 2A plus patients on VSM3 monitoring, which means that they have to do their vital signs three times a day. Uh, we do a quick shock index triaging for the nurses to be able to escalate uh, any abnormal vital signs. And uh, we then do a compliance monitoring um, with the help of IT as well as other simple tricks. So the version one was when we first opened hall three and four, and each patient was actually given a set of a BP, temperature, SpO2, as well as a tablet. Then, of course, we quickly realized that this was really not possible with 8,000 patients. So the version two is actually um, the centralized kiosk that you see there. There are actually instructions pasted on the floor or on the table, uh, translated into various languages on how you use it step-by-step -step pictorial guide. And uh, then we have a portable SPO2. The health discovery part of the picture below is actually how the internet-based uh, platform looks like. And to give you a quick idea, this is how the data flows and red color would highlight, will be highlighting the abnormal signs for easy recognition. My nurses actually sit in a dedicated room to be reviewing these results. Some of them sit in a clean zone to be reviewing these results, but we find that then there needs to be an additional communication between the clean zone and the nurses in a dirty zone to quickly grab these patients and go. So uh, there are some patients that the nurses then prefer to monitor them inside the dirty zone as well. And um, a very quick idea of what shock index is, it's actually a heart rate divided by the systolic BP. 
and normal shock index is supposed to be less than 0.7, and more than one is actually a specific predictor of hyperlipidemia and 28 day mortality. So, um, there are, of course, um, people who disagreed with shock index because it was a, to them, it felt that it was a bit simplified. But we felt that it was just an easy way for the nurses to triage instead of having to highlight every heart rate of 101 or every systolic BP of 98. Um, to the medical team because there's such a wide variation of, of things. Um, so this is a pictorial diagram of what how we can play around with the health discovery platform to look at trends, to look at um, whether there's a change in the systolic BP, diastolic BP. There's actually a flagged up um, for the nurses to fill in, like why do they need to alert and audit and what has happened this kind of serve as a documentation. Um, so moving on, how do we ensure compliance? So the nurses actually go around with this loud hailer three times a day to say, hi, please go and take your temperature monitoring, your, your vital signs monitoring. Um, some of them even actually at admission set alarms for the patients to say, please go and take your vital signs when the alarms ring. Uh, usually we do this for those who need three times a day monitoring because that's a lot harder to remember. And my nurses, um, as you can see, they're pushing our cows, going on physical rounds to kind of catch all those um, non-compliant patients. Uh, we even do an SMS broadcast to their phones as well to say, please go and take your vital signs or please come to the medical post. Um, um, IT, IHIS has also been a really great help. So what they did is they came up with this compliance chart monitoring and every day kind of have an idea of how good or how um, naughty our patients have been and how, when do we need to go and grab these patients and all that. So this is kind of like a report per se. Um, the third thing that we experimented with is, is this uh, device called Bioformis, which is a wearable um, medical device that measures your continuous heart rate and respiratory rate. It does a skin measurement of a temperature and SpO2, but the patient still needs to go to the self-service kiosk to your blood pressure. But what it does is at least gives you a continuous monitoring. And we use this for patients who are unwell or phase two or other patients that require closer monitoring. However, we also found that there were actually um, pitfalls associated with bioformis and it kind of slowly fell out of favor towards the end of Expo because of skin burn. Because um, the patients were not supposed to be using it continuously over one spot, but they were supposed to change arms and change positions. Uh, the patients also then slept on it and there were a lot of pressure points. So this is how the device actually works. looks like. It's actually a monitoring, a wearable device on the arm, and then it shows you um, the continuous readings. So like I said, it kind of slowly fell out of favor as we used. Um, so to move along, what we've learned is Expo is definitely not the same as what we're used to in the hospitals or clinical setup. Uh, we had to come up with um, new ideas and new devices that can be our eyes and ears in the hall. However, no one system is good enough. And we then have to keep refining and reviewing our processes. And everyone really does play a part. So with that, um, I'll show you some artwork from our patients during uh, the, the Hari Raya celebrations. And this is my wonderful, part of my wonderful team that has been there. And uh, some of the allied health staff. And I would really like to thank um, many, many people who have been on this journey with me and, and given me us very much um, guidance and, and help along the way. So um, with that, uh, thank you for your attention and I would like to pass back to Prof T. Thank you, Dr. Tohan. I think uh, Singapore owes a debt of gratitude to you and your team for uh, stepping up to the challenge and being innovative at the same time. We're slightly behind time, so I'll quickly move on to our next speaker. Uh, she's Miss Clarice Wee uh, from Ng Teng Fong General Hospital. Clarice is uh, an advanced practice nurse uh, who is part of the outreach team and leads the tracheostomy team uh, and also works in a combined high dependency and intensive care unit. She has a lead role in the development and training of APNs in the hospital and is involved in teachings at uh, the National University of Singapore and is also the course director for the basic assessment and support in intensive care for nurses course. Clarice will be talking to us about rapid response and red zone alerts. So over to you, Clarice. 
Thank you, Dr. T, for the introduction. Uh, let me just... Um... Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Dr. T, for the introduction. Let me just put my share screen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon um, on a Saturday. I would just like to share with you today a little bit about the automated red zone trigger alert system in Ng Teng Fong General Hospital and uh, what the ICU outreach nurses have been doing to help patients. Uh, so back in 2017, um, the ICU team developed an automatic activation for code blue and peri-arrest patients in Ng Teng Fong General Hospital. This system was initiated as part of the intensive care medicine's efforts to reduce in-hospital cardiac arrest rates and also to try and improve mortality and morbidity rates. With this automated system, our in-hospital cardiac arrest rates improved from 1.22 to 0.95. Here with this automated process, the nurses do not have to memorize the peri-arrest criteria. And once the patient's vitals meet that criteria, the nurses just verify the vitals to ensure it's accurate and the code blue is automatically activated. Here, the code blue team at, uh, uh, will then run to the patient, um, even though it's not an actual code blue, but the patient is in peri-arrest. Uh, so this means that the nurses do not need to leave the unstable patient to call for the relevant parties and reduces the delay in calling them and allowing them to tend to the sick patient whilst the code blue team is activated. This also allows us to catch the patients who might not have been identified by nurses to be sick. And ultimately, this ensures standards of care, whereby junior nurses or staff who might have limited experience in identifying deteriorating patients are supported with the aim of a person's care. As the automated uh, peri-arrest system went into steady state, we started to look into red zone alerts for patients and how we can identify and treat deteriorating patients. So we started a pilot project in January 2020 that enabled some of the ICU nurses to form the ICU outreach team and take up some responsibility. Here, the ICU outreach nurses will be the first responders for selected cases. They will assess and initiate simple treatment for patients prior to the physician's attendance and follow up on the progress of the patient if the patient is deemed stable enough to stay in the general ward. We took advantage of the combined ICU model that we have in Ansipom General Hospital to develop an ICU outreach nursing service where the physicians and nurses can work closely to prevent further deterioration in the sick patient and improve the knowledge and skills of the general ward nurses when carrying the patient. So as Dr. Sohan mentioned, uh, now everybody's familiar with the new score. Um, as uh, she mentioned, regularly when a patient has a new score of more than or equals to seven, uh, the nurse would be required to call the primary team or registrar to review the patient. Uh, this is so in Ng Teng Fong General Hospital, but however, um, we met some resistance as some of the nurses would actually be told to call the HO or MO because the registrar might be in surgery or the registrar might be in clinic. Um, or the nurse, after you know, a certain period of time, would actually then just not even think about calling the registrar, but call the house officer or the medical officer directly. And this causes a lot of unnecessary delay and really depends on whether the house officer or the medical officer is able to um, uh, recognize the deteriorating patient and then flag it up to the registrar. As, as such, for higher risk patients, we added the automated red zone trigger alerts so that um, the various hospital staff will be alerted when there is a deteriorating patient. This means that for higher risk patients, they have an automated backup system as a fail safe on top of the manual system. As you can see, our criteria for automated red zone alert is slightly different from the news tool policy for clinical risk response. Using the news 2 score of 7 or more, we saw that there were about 40 to 60 red zone alerts per day, of which about 30 to 45 of them will require actual physical reviews. This number was a little overwhelming for the ICU outreach team um, because it's a new team uh, that starting out, the, the ICU nurses are also trying to figure their way around this whole system. Um, and only one of them is assigned to do this role per shift. So as we are starting on piloting this service, we decided to concentrate on patients with an aggregate score of 10 or more. This ensured that we focused on the higher risk patients with less fatigability and to cut down the alerts to about 10 to 12 per day, which uh, amounted to maybe about five to eight physical reviews, which was more manageable for the new team and service. 
At the same time, the target single parameters were included so that we are able to catch the truly sick patients. You can see that the SVP of uh, 80 mmHg is used as a target rather than 90, um, as previous reviews, uh, as previously seen. So the ICU outreach, um, uh, the reason why we chose that was because the ICU outreach nurses actually fed back that uh, many female patients who were asleep at night um, actually have an SVP of less than uh, 90, about 88 to 89. And this caused a lot of unnecessary reviews and disturbance of the patient's sleep at night. Once the trigger peri parameters are met, it goes through several middleware and servers to send out the trigger messaging to the various smartphones. Here you can see we have the Philips IGS, Philips IDE, um, the email server, and then goes to um, the connection alarm, uh, and then subsequently to the smartphones and to the IP phones that we use it. With the red zone automated alerts, the messages get sent to various people. Uh, during office hours, this message is sent to the outreach nurse smartphone, the ward nurse in charge, and also the unit sister in charge. Um, after the office hours, the registrar will also receive the trigger alert. However, during office hours, uh, the ward and IC will need to forward the triggering message to the respective registrar and consultant. The message that the physicians and nurses receive on their phone will have the following important details. Uh, the patient's NRIC, patient surname, consultant in charge, the nurse login ID, the trigger alert reason, uh, allergies, principal diagnosis, and the full brain and the vital signs set of the patient. So after the ICU outreach nurse uh, receives the trigger alert, the ICU outreach nurse will then conduct an initial assessment to evaluate if the trigger alert warrants a physical review. They go into the uh, electronic medical record system that we have called EPIC, um, and review the vital signs and review whether or not it's a, um, a false alert or not. Uh, certain times the vitals are incomplete or entered incorrectly. Uh, for example, if the respiratory rate is not recorded within the vital sign machine, or if the O2 device is missed out, and this can trigger a false red zone alert. If the patient is deemed uh, sick uh, to require a, a physical review, the ICU outreach nurse will review the patient within 30 minutes and conduct a con comprehensive head to toe examination. They will then collaborate with the primary team and the primary nurse to suggest and evaluate treatment for the ICU for the patient. If they deem that the patient requires further support and possibly requires high D or ICU admission, he or she is then referred to the ICU consultant for assessment of higher care. With this automated trigger system, uh, the nurses are actually empowered to call the registrar and ask if they have received the trigger message. A lot of times, um, the reasons why initially the nurses would call the house officer or medical officer is because um, sometimes they do get uh, uh, replies from the registrar asking them why they are being called. Um, and so this really empowers the nurses to be able to call the registrar. And if the registrar, and we ask the registrar if they've received the trigger message, if the answer is yes, they would ask if there is anything they can do to assist and help whilst waiting for them to come and review the patient. Um, if the registrar says no, they have not received the message, then the primary nurse um, who is already on the phone with them will inform the doctor about the patient's condition using the s -bar. So we initially started this uh, in January 2020, as I mentioned earlier, um, and it was quite small because it was, we were just starting and trying to figure out our way around the system, uh, trying to introduce ourselves to the general ward nurses and to the primary teams in the general ward and what the nurse's role was, because people were quite confused as to what is ICU nurse doing here, and why is ICU nurse um, trying to help me diagnose my drugs, or why is the ICU nurse trying to help me run this medication and monitor my patient. Um, however, when COVID hit, we had to stop the pilot, as the nursing manpower was really quite critical. Throughout this time, though, uh, the red zone trigger alerts continued to average about 250 to 250 per month. Once COVID stabilized, we picked it up again in July, and on average now, the outreach nurses are actually reviewing about 200 to 250 cases per month, which equates to about seven to 10 cases per day. So out of the cases seen, about half of them, uh, about 47 to 50% of them, were actually partial COVID patients. So in an attempt to differentiate between the withdrawal of care versus sealing of care, and to prevent any unnecessary triggers, we have improved the system now, with the primary team's order, a partial code um, 
when the primitive orders a partial coat, which means uh, do not resuscitate for the patient. Um, and they select the following, as you can see there, no vasopressors or no fluid boluses for hypotension. The automatic uh, red zone trigger alert system will not be activated for them. Similarly, on our Philips uh, vital sign machine called the MP5SC, you can see the COPD profile for COPD patients. So um, if the patient has a history of COPD and is admitted for maybe a COPD exacerbation, uh, the nurses are able to choose this COPD profile for them after the physician has placed um, the order and epic. This order entails that the SPLP for COPD patients is at between 88 to 92% and the automatic trigger alerts are not activated for them if the nurse chooses this protocol. So this is a new concept here in Ng Ting Fong, and as part of being involved in the rapid response system for red zone trigger alerts, the ICU outreach teams also provide services such as line tracking, track your stimulator, and post high ICU discharge from work. Uh, as we refine the system and as we review our data, we might need to move our um, threshold for trigger alert system up or down according to the data that we collect from the hospital and from the triggers that we receive. Um, so, uh, with this, we empower our nurses to support the development of knowledge and skills of the ICU and general nurses and want to ultimately improve patient outcomes. All right, thank you, Clarice. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, nursing involvement is definitely an integral component in um, rapidly responding to patients in the hospital. Uh, we come to our last speaker, uh, and he is Professor Hong Sambung from uh, Asan Medical Center in South Korea. Um, Professor Hong uh, is currently an intensivist and professor, Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care, Asan Medical Center, University of Ulsan College of Medicine. Um, he has interest in ECMO, rapid response systems, ARDS, sepsis, lung transplantation, and simulation in uh, the research field. He has published more than 200 papers uh, in uh, peer-reviewed journals, and he was awarded the Korean Society of Critical Care Medicine and uh, European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and Society of Critical Care Medicine Best Paper and granted by the Korean government. And uh, we are Glad to have Professor Hong talk to us about decreasing collateral damage from COVID-19. So over to you, Professor Hong. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for a nice in introduction, uh, Dr. T. Uh, may I see my presentation? Uh, okay, the, today I'm going to talk about evolution of uh, rapid response in the face of uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is a classification of COVID-19 severity um, from a uh, symptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, and critical illness. Uh, as we rapid response team usually taking care of uh, severe and critical illness, so severe illness respiratory late auto saturation and PO2 is very important. So uh, previous speakers already told about MUSE. So our hospital uh, currently using MUSE, uh, but uh, MUSE included only uh, respiratory late. So this kind of COVID-19 and uh, use uh, will be better uh, oxygen saturation and auto oxygen supply. So I picked up the one paper from uh, other hospital in Korea. Uh, they uh, designated COVID-19 patient. Uh, this paper included uh, 110 patient, uh, not big number in Korea. So uh, 110 patient a day. Uh, compare the three screening system, the SIRS, QSOPA, and NEWS. The AUC curve value 
the usage uh, better than uh, SARS and QSOPA. And interestingly, the survival probability uh, news score uh, below four is 100% survival, uh, five to six, and uh, news, uh, news score more than seven score has a uh, uh, more mortality. So anyway, uh, this paper shows uh, news to score is uh, very good for COVID-19 patient. Uh, I have already uh, see some some paper showed some uh, less uh, power, but it, it can be uh, different from situation. So, uh, as you can see, we know the COVID-19 patient that time course is very important for our team. So, what kind of situation this patient may so can you transfer this patient to ICU or just stay in a general world like that? You know, usually stage one is uh, first week. So maybe more than 80% of patient are stable. So stage one is enough for 80%, but 20% uh, of percentage patient are aggravated. So 20% uh, of COVID patient, uh, including stage two. Uh, if the stage two patient, almost 50% patient are aggravated to AIDS. So phase two is very important for pneumonia patient. So, uh, this knowledge is very important for RRS team. Uh, this is our case in South Korea. You know, the uh, very early period uh, in our country, we had an outbreak in uh, one city. So as we know, the very rapidly case increased in COVID-19. Uh, fortunately, uh, one hospital uh, was designated uh, regional uh, COVID-19 patient. So uh, patient, uh, all patient transferred to other hospital and this uh, hospital designated COVID-19 hospital. So actually uh, the doctors uh, uh, treated COVID-19 uh, first time just 10 bed. Uh, not a luxury ICU, but in, uh, you know, outbreak time, so it's not easy to make a luxury ICU. Anyway, the one week later, the ICU expanded more than 10, so 20 ICU bed handled in this COVID-19 designated hospital in this city. Uh, timeline is uh, already, uh, you know, the usually eight days is uh, very uh, not very sick. The admitted usually uh, day seven, and next day oxygen therapy is needed, and the next day mechanical ventilation is needed for uh, AIDS patient. So timeline is uh, very important. I want to share some uh, mortality. How do we face uh, this kind of COVID-19 for RRS team, uh, globally mortality is 4%, but uh, America 4% mortality, European 6.8%, uh, Korea is 2 point. This paper from China, they included uh, 44,000 uh, patient. Anyway, this patient uh, showed Severe patient 14 percentage, critical patient uh, 5 percentage. So uh, COVID patient, 20 patient are very severe. So this is a bad story for RRS. How about uh, Wuhan, outbreak time, uh, look at just only invasive mechanical ventilation. They applied 110 patient, mortality related agent more than 90. How about uh, Italy? Lombardy had some outbreak. Uh, they uh, applied mechanical ventilation 1,100. Uh, 
deaths uh, 780 patients, so more around 70 patients were dead during mechanical ventilation. How about Mexico? Uh, Mexico in this hospital, uh, more than 90% of the patient uh, treated uh, COVID-19 patient, so outbreak happened. So they in, uh, applied them invasive mechanical ventilation, mortality around 80%. Interesting thing is they already had some ICU or hardly 70% mortality. In this hospital, ICU shortage happened. So they made one, another ICU in general world, you know, the, just the uh, RLS involved in this kind of situation anyway. Uh, uh, unfortunately, non-ICU admission showed more than 90% of patients were dead. How about USA? You know, the New York was very chaotic. Uh, in this paper, they included a severe patient, only 250 patient uh, deaths, 100. But uh, in this paper, uh, they applied uh, mechanical ventilation 200, so around 50% of mortality in New York, big hospital. This is a co Korean paper. Uh, this is a severity score. Uh, at this time, Korea is not big number of COVID patient. I'm working in private hospital, so our hospital only taking care of 50 COVID patient and the severe patient only five or so. Our data is just so small number. So I uh, pick up the, our national data. So uh, severity score five means high pronasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation. And uh, number six is invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, severity seven is ECMO anyway. Uh, including 50% mortality was uh, uh, rate of 28. I guess for invasive mechanical ventilation, maybe 50% mortality in this is our hospital. I searched the PubMed, but I only uh, uh, pick up only one paper, RRS paper, COVID-19 pandemic, on our rapid response team in Brazil. Uh, Brazil, you know, the outbreak happened. So this uh, hospital, 400 bed, around 100 ICU bed hospital. COVID-19 outbreak, around 90% patient they took care. Uh, their RIT was changed. Um, manpower, this is before and after trial, before, Outbreak, they only two medical persons, but uh, uh, during COVID-19, four uh, medical professionals involved. They're calling patient before 30 per day, but around 80 patient called the patient. Critical case, uh, 3.5 to 22 patient per day. Extremely critical cases, before period, 10%, but COVID-19 outbreak, 20%. But fortunately, RRS team maybe took care of COVID patient very well, mortality was unchanged. The, this hospital, the activation of RRS is rapidly increasing uh, COVID-19 period. The critical case also rapidly increased. Uh, they uh, the, look at the, the severe patient, uh, low risk, medium risk patient uh, looks the same, but uh, severe patient increased uh, during COVID-19 patient. And uh, in this hospital, they look at the mute, not mute. Uh, anyway, mute score also before period and during COVID-19 period uh, increased. How about ICU transporting? Uh, the ICU transporting was a significant increase uh, during COVID-19 period, and this is mortality. In this hospital, mortality was no difference. 
we analyzed the before uh, and after also. Uh, this is our hospital uh, uh, compared to January to September. Bed activation case uh, uh, 2019, uh, 2,500 cases. Uh, this year, 2,200 cases. Uh, looks a decrease, uh, but because uh, we made one general ward, uh, uh, COVID-19 patient general ward, so uh, our hospital decreased the uh, general ward bed because, uh, you know, COVID-19 manpower are needed more. Uh, Met dose was uh, not decreased uh, compared to 2019. CPCR rate was uh, not increased. Fortunately, 2020. Anyway, uh, transport to ICU transport rate was not big difference. What I did in our hospital COVID-19 simulation, we did in our center because uh, uh, we made one general world uh, for COVID-19 only. So around the 40 bed, we made a repertory and we educated the general world nurses, RIT education, and uh, we are using music, but uh, COVID-19 use is better, uh, we thought. So we uh, taught use how to use taught to RIT education, basic critical care for nurses. They satisfied very much about for COVID-19 general the, the teaching about that. And we also simulation to pulmonary payload about LA, you know, the COVID-19 uh, intubation is uh, different from other patient. So this is the last slide for my uh, lecture. COVID-19 patient increase rapidly in society almost the 20 percentage of patients are severe patient. But if admitted only hypoxic patient in hospital, RRS members should know around 50 percentage are aggravated during hospitalization. Uh, these patients are needed for RRS team. I should bed need to be expanded rapidly so in that case, ICU capacity, manpower, and equipment also needed. If not, many severe patients should be managed by RIT on general world. So in this case, RIT loading will be increased. And if ICU bad shortage condition, RIT can be chaotic, in my opinion. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Prof Hong. We have uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, so um, you can post your questions in the Q&A uh, chat function. Um, but I think I, I will uh, maybe start uh, some questions to uh, some of our speakers, maybe beginning with uh, Professor Hong. Um, it's quite interesting how um, your hospital manage, manages the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic. Uh, I was just wondering, um, were any of your rapid response team, RRT staff um, were made to uh, sort of the name power was channeled to the COVID wards or the COVID ICU? Do you face a, a reduction in uh, manpower? Uh, in our hospital, uh, the in hospital the manager recognized in this kind of uh, uh, very, uh, you know, the many, many, many the critical ill patient can happen. So actually our hospital, the manager supported the RLS. So we manpower is increased <laughs> during COVID-19 at this period. So we are more training nurses and we, we, we have more manpower at this time. But right. uh, fortunately, so, at this time, we, our hospital, we don't have a, no outbreak. Right. That's great to hear. Uh, I uh, also asked uh, Clarice, uh, just a question. Uh, as I look through your presentation, I was just wondering, are there any challenges um, 
that nurses face uh, with these um, uh, red zone alerts that uh, sort of, I don't know whether it catches them by surprise when the uh, alerts come out. Uh, does it add a bit more work in terms of them checking whether the red zone alerts are genuine or not? Um, yeah, so there, there is definitely that workload of um, checking and looking through the charts to actually make sure whether it is a genuine red zone or whether it's a false red zone. Um, but I guess this, this time taken to do that is, is less than the actual physical review of walking to the ward and actually checking to see whether um, the patient is okay. So we, we try and filter out that way first so that the nurses don't get too tired um, and then subsequently review the ones that we actually need to do a physical review. Um, the, the challenges that they face is actually, uh, I would say because it's a new system um, and they've not, uh, the general ward nurses and the primary team haven't really heard of the system very much. We do road shows for them. Um, we did it over the month of October, but it's still relatively new. So uh, just not, the, the team's not understanding what the exact goals of the ICU outreach nurse was um, and how we can help. So sometimes they feel like when the nurses ask, can I help you dilute this drug or can I help you um, spike up this medication, the general nurses will say, no, I'm okay, I'm fine. But you know, in actual fact, the ICU outreach team is there to help. Um, so they're, they're quite shy at taking help uh, initially, but we hope that uh, with time, they will come to know the system and, and take our help. Yes. So, uh, yes, I think um, that sounds like uh, something uh, regarding uh, role clarity. La. I think people just um, are a bit embarrassed to ask for help, I guess, sometimes. Uh, and uh, along the same uh, topic of the uh, news score, I just wanted to ask Dr. Tohan as well, since you, you presented about new score in a, a very unique facility that is not a hospital. Um, and with your experience, do you think a new score uh, will be uh, something that uh, you would uh, do in your new Woodlands Health Campus? Uh, thanks, Dr. Dr. Tohan. Question. Um, so to be very frank, because um, I'm an aesthetist, so I, I am more used to crunching all the numbers presented to me rather than just looking at the overall aggregate. Um, I think the new score, as I've done a bit of reading up and all that, is actually very useful for the pre-hospital paramedics and maybe the ED department to kind of quickly gauge how well or unwell this patient is and, and whether or not there should be an escalation of care. So I felt that looking at what the new score have in terms of their parameters alone may be more useful for a pre-hospital setting but whereas in a hospital with um, more resources and more access to investigations maybe it would just be an augmentation to your clinical judgment rather than the sole uh, decision making but um, I think as Clarice mentioned it also uh, does serve as a good guidance for the nurses to say hey we need to pay attention to this um, patient in the ward or patient in the ED closer but Nothing beats a clinical evaluation, I feel. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, that those are very wise opinions. Uh, my, my last uh, question is for Roshni. You mentioned uh, something interesting about putting the N95 mask uh, inside the PAPR. I'm just wondering how, how does the team uh, train uh, so that they are, I, I guess they're not audible to one another. So how do they... Um, do that communication during a, a, a CPR or a resuscitation process with both N95 mask and PAPR, uh, you know, worn. Hello, can you hear me, Dr. T? Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Turn I, on I was, your video. Uh, yeah, the, it says that the host doesn't allow me to turn. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Sorry, Dr. I missed your question. So you were saying... Yes, uh, I was asking, what, how do they communicate with N95 masks and PAPR <laughs> one together? 
<laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, very good question. I think uh, initially what we did in our planning phase was that we sort of like, you know, role assigned and we sort of uh, had labels on the gowns. So at least the team were, um, you know, understood who was doing what, uh, uh, you know, role. Um, and then I realized during the training, I, I see a lot of uh, gesturing going on. And also, uh, once they have practiced their roles, people do so, sort of like, you know, fit into their, like they, they assume that the doctor is going to take uh, on the airway. And then, uh, you know, so uh, they will allow for that to happen. Similarly, the nurses sometimes will take on the drugs, uh, the respiratory therapist prepares the equipment. So there are some roles that are assigned. They are labeled on their gown. So people coming in know who's doing what. Um, and then the scriber, uh, puts down the essential information on a whiteboard. And sometimes that whiteboard can also help to, you know, get the information going. But it does, it does, uh, you know, communication is one of the uh, weak links in this kind of resuscitation. Thank you, thank you. I think we're right on the dot uh, at the end of this track. So thank you, uh, Professor Hong, Clarice, Tohan and Roshni for, um, very entertaining uh, session. And uh, to everyone else, you can still post your questions on, on, the, on the function. Uh, so have a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And uh, thank you.